Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number 13. Welcome, everyone. I guess if you believe in that kind of stuff, this is unlucky episode number 13. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to say, hopefully for you, it's going to be lucky episode number 13. I do hope you enjoy uh, today's podcast. Have a lot of great stuff, a lot of great uh, ground that we're going to cover. Um, But again, once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, to join us on the homestead journey. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of things that you could be listening to, a lot of things that you could be doing right now, and greatly appreciate the fact that you are joining us uh, on this episode. Today on the uh, on 3B Farm and Homestead, we had a snowstorm. Well, last night into today, we had about seven inches of snow, and uh, it is just beautiful. When you have that fresh snow, and it was that light, fluffy snow. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And it takes all of that dirt and mud and it covers it up. And it just makes everything look so beautiful and so clean. And it, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, the, the weather here has just been really, really weird. And it was so warm last Saturday. I think it was up in the 60s. And it was so warm that the mountain where my son and I teach skiing and snowboarding ended up having to close this week because of lack of snow. And uh, the end of the week, they were able to make some snow, and then we had the seven inches, and so hopefully this will propel them through the season. Um, but it's just been wacky, wacky weather this winter. It started off with a bang, really cold, a lot of snow, then it warmed up, and now we're back to winter here in the great northeast. Anyhow, let's jump right into this week's homestead happenings. What's been going on on 3B Farm and Homestead? Well, as I said, snowstorm uh, last night into today, and uh, the animals seem to be enjoying the snow. In fact, I posted some pictures of our ducks and geese enjoying the snow to our newly created Instagram page, so our Instagram account. I don't know. I'm relatively new to Instagram. And when I say relatively new to Instagram, I've had an Instagram account for a long time. I just hardly ever use it, a personal one. But I thought that it might be good to start one for the podcast um, because I know not not everybody is on Facebook. And so this will give you an opportunity for you to be able to kind of follow our journey there. So our name, handle, whatever it's called on Instagram is uh, The Homestead Journey Podcast. Try to keep it simple for you. So uh, give us a follow there, and uh, you'll be able to see our geese and our ducks out enjoying the snow. Uh, It's just absolutely beautiful. Enjoyed uh, getting the tractor out today and uh, making short work of that snow. So I've got a Coyote CK3510SE that we bought last year. and Well, actually, when I say last year, it was actually 2018 is when I took delivery of it. And uh, it was a pass down and a pass back and bada bing, bada boom, it was done. And uh, in a future episode, I'll talk about buying a tractor for your homestead. But that thing has just been an absolute godsend, Um, not only for snow removal, but for moving wood chips around and really just, well, saving my back because I'm not getting any younger. And in, in speaking of not getting any younger, yesterday my wife celebrated her birthday and so we went out to dinner last night. We were planning on going over to the next town over, but because of the snowstorm, uh, we didn't uh, venture that far. We stayed, well, when I say the next town over, the next big town over, we went to the next town over for dinner last night and enjoyed that. But uh, so happy birthday to you, dear. Love you so much. Um, other things going on on the homestead this week. We had a litter of piglets born. And as I shared with you on last week's episode, I knew the sow was getting ready to pop. And uh, so she did have, I thought it was seven piglets, but there's only six out there now. And so either I miscounted or um, she, one of them died and uh, 
she may have eaten it. She probably would have eaten it because I think that's an instinct that they have. Uh, if a piglet dies, they'll eat it, not because they're bad mothers, but actually because they're good mothers. Um, because if that piglet were to stay there and to decompose, it would cause issues uh, with the other piglets. And not only that, but potentially call in other predators. So um, be that as it may, we have three boys, three girls, and this sow is a great mom. I really, really love this sow. Um, she does such a great job with her piglets. I did set up um, because of when she had the piglets, it was relatively mild, but I knew some cold weather was coming in towards the end of the week. And so I set up a creeper. Uh, what I did is I took a piece of a cattle panel that I had left from when I built some trellises for our raised beds. I put that in the corner, zip tied it in place, have a heat lamp behind it. That way the piglets can kind of snuggle up together under that heat lamp. It keeps them warm, but it will keep the mom from knocking that heat lamp off of uh, off of the side of the little hut we have there. And if you have any interest in that, you can jump over to our Facebook page. There's pictures of that, uh, as well as um, I took some video of a piglet being born, and that was really, really cool. And so that's also up on, I can't remember if I posted that to the 3B Farm page or to the... Um, to the uh, podcast page, look in, in one place or the other, there's video of an American guinea hog piglet being born. Very, very, very cool thing to see. The other things we've had going on here on the homestead this week is just a lot of conversations with regards to the direction that we're going to take this year with uh, the homestead. And so yesterday, as my son and I were traveling down to the mountain to teach, uh, he and I had a great conversation with regards to uh, the chickens and the turkeys and so forth that we want to get here uh, in 2020. And so he and I will be making those decisions uh, in the next few weeks. The local feed store where sometimes I have bought chicks through them for their chick days because it is relatively about the same amount of money as to have them shipped directly to me. And by buying them through my local feed store, I'm supporting the local merchant. And so I like to do that when I can. Uh, so I picked up the packet of the breeds that they're going to have available towards the end of March for their chick days. And so my son and I will go through those and uh, make some decisions and some tough decisions. But uh, we will make our decisions with regards to the breeds we're going to get this year. And once we make that decision, we will share that with you so that you are up to date with what's going here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Other than that, not a whole lot going on just simply because of the weather. I've been jumping into seed catalogs and kind of looking at those. Uh, got a couple of different uh, seed catalogs that arrived this week. Found out about a couple of other seed companies that I didn't know existed, so I've been exploring those um, and really, you know, kind of getting very excited about, um, you know, getting some seeds started. But uh, that's probably at least a month or maybe even two away before I'll get anything started. Um, but really starting to get excited about that. And uh, hopefully we will have a bountiful harvest this year. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this episode's Charting the Course, um, what I want to do is talk about some myths and misconceptions that people have with regards to homesteading. And in fact, we're going to talk about seven myths or misconceptions. Now, before we jump into that, I do want to start out with a few caveats. Uh, first of all, as always, this is my opinion. Okay, I am not an expert, and you may disagree with me, and that's fine. But if you disagree with me, I would ask you to do me a favor. Actually, two favors. First of all, if you disagree with me, please listen to the entirety of the episode. I may say some things and probably will say some things that could be construed as controversial and may, well, be different than what you have been led to believe with regards to homesteading. If you think I'm wrong, please don't get mad and shut it off. Hear me out. And then if you still disagree with me, let me know. Show me the error of my ways. Let's make this a, a dialogue, right? A conversation. And uh, so you can send me an email at thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com 
or you can contact us via our Facebook page. The uh, link to our page is in the show notes. Um, or contact me on our new Instagram account. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, and I would love to hear your feedback if you disagree with me. Again, I may say some things that some might construe as controversial. And please understand, I am not doing this or not putting together this podcast to be controversial. This, again, is just my opinion, my perspective with regards to some misconceptions I think that people have with regards to homesteading. Also, I am not putting this episode out to crush anybody's dreams, okay? Um, And if I say anything that challenges your dreams, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Again, contact me. I would be more than happy to have a conversation with you with regards to my opinion and my perspective. But my goal is not to discourage anybody from homesteading. Rather, my goal is to set people up for success. And I think that if you are chasing um, a, a misconception or a myth with regards to homesteading, what that is going to do, it is going to lead you to be discouraged, disenfranchised, and then you are going to stop pursuing self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And that's not what I want. Rather, I want you to be successful. And so if, again, if I say something that you disagree with, uh, we can have that conversation. But my goal is to make sure that people are set up to be successful in the pursuit of this lifestyle. So having said all of that, Let's jump right into this episode's charting the course. So, myth or misconception number one is that there somewhere exists magical free land for homesteaders. Now, this misconception comes from the Homestead Act uh, that was enacted in the United States in 1862. That Homestead Act under that Homestead Act and subsequent acts, people were granted free land if they fulfilled certain obligations. It was under this act that Ma and Pa Ingalls were able to get their homestead as they were, it was kind of the the way the government was encouraging people to settle the West. Now, not to get into all of the politics of that, I know there are people who say, well, the land was stolen from the Indians and all of those kinds of things. We could debate that back and forth. That's not the point of this episode. The fact is, there was in place at one point in time a an act here in the United States whereby people were given free, and I use huge air quotes there, land that was owned, and again, huge air quotes, by the government uh, if they fulfilled certain obligations. That act was actually rescinded in the late 70s. I think it might have been 1976 or 1978. Somewhere in that time frame, that was, it might have been 1979. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. But in the late 70s, that act was rescinded. There is no longer any free land for homesteaders at least not like that. And if you're aware of free land for homesteaders, please let me know. If I'm wrong on this, I would love some of that there free land, (laughs) but it doesn't exist any longer. So that's myth or misconception number one. The second myth or misconception about homesteading that I wanna talk about is that you are going to save money by homesteading. By and large, this is not going to happen. As a lifestyle, homesteading is relatively expensive. It is not cheap to homestead. And if you are comparing your food bill uh, that you are going to have after homesteading to a grocery budget where you are living on packets of ramen noodle (laughs) and, and other highly processed and highly subsidized foods, it's simply not going to be more cost effective for you to be able to raise and grow your own food. Now, if you compare apples to apples, all right, organic apple to organic apple, 
<laughs> organic tomatoes to organic tomatoes, if you compare it at that level over what you would buy, let's say at a farmer's market or a an organic grocery store, a Whole Foods or something like that, then probably you can grow those things for less. In fact, I know you can. I mean, let's say that you go down to the grocery store and you pick up a pint of uh, cherry tomatoes. I don't know what they go for, but let's say just say they go for $3.99 for a pint of cherry tomatoes. Well, for $2.99, you can buy a flat of cherry tomatoes and grow a whole lot of cherry tomatoes in your backyard. But you also need to factor in other costs, right? If you are going to get into gardening on a big scale, depending on how you do it, there are tools that you need to invest in. You, you've got to buy, maybe you need to buy trellises and put them up, fencing and put them up. Um, perhaps you're going to till, you need to get a tiller. You need to pay somebody to come in and till and break up the ground. Or if you're going to uh, use a no-till method, you need to buy a broad fork. Or you need to maybe buy or find source uh, wood chips. And then you've got the, if you're going to use a back to Eden style method, or if you're going to use Ruth Stout, you need to get hay. All of those things uh, require inputs and they're going to require uh, time, effort, and energy. And then not only that, but then you need to preserve the harvest because again, you may not be able to grow uh, tomatoes year round. Uh, and if you want to grow tomatoes year round, you're going to need to invest in infrastructure to be able to grow uh, tomatoes year round. And so there's those costs, right? All of that stuff ends up adding up. Let's just take chicken, for example. I can buy a lot of chicken at the store for what it costs me to raise and grow my own chicken, right? Chicken maybe sometimes is a buck seventy nine a pound, a buck ninety nine a pound for Tyson or Purdue chicken at the grocery store. My cost, if I pay somebody to process my chickens, is almost a dollar a pound on average. Let's say chicken dresses out at about five pounds. I'm just, it may go a little long, uh, higher than that, but my cost per chicken at my local processor is $5. So already I've got a dollar a pound in processing cost. I haven't bought a chick yet. I have not put any kind of feed into it. I've not accounted for the, um, I've not accounted for the, the, the coops. I've not accounted for the feeders. I've not accounted for anything else. I'm already in at a dollar a pound. Now over time, yes, it may pay for itself. And if I compare that to the cost of going to the farmer's market and paying $4.50 a pound for chicken or $5 a pound for chicken, then yes, maybe it does start to balance out. But I'm not saving a whole heck of a lot of money by doing this if you factor, even if I'm going to process it myself. I need to have a plucker. I need to have kill cones. I need to, again, all of those things add up. So if you are getting into homesteading and you think you're going to save money, it's going to take a long time for you to see a return on your investment. And yes, maybe over time you will, but when even when you think about canning, let's just use that as an example. You've got to buy a canner. You've got to buy jars. You've got to buy lids. You've got to buy rings. And you haven't put a single thing into a jar yet. For all of that upfront start up cost, you can buy a lot of food at the grocery store. So again, and, and this is not to discourage anybody, I just want you to realize that there's a real cost to raising real food. If you are getting into homesteading because you think you're going to save money, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> the next myth or misconception that people have is that there is a huge air quotes here, right way to homestead. And we talked about this a little bit back on our episode with regards to what is homesteading. But there are people who seem to have in their minds that there is only one right way to homestead. And if you are not homesteading like they homestead, then you are not a real homesteader. If you're not organic, if you aren't practicing permaculture, if you don't practice no-till, if you're not cooking from scratch, if you're not cooking on a wood stove, if you're not heating with wood, if you're not off-grid, if you're not cooking in cast iron, if you don't homeschool your kids, you are not a real homesteader, according to some people. 
This week in one of the Facebook groups, there was someone who made a post uh, that where they were lamenting the fact that there are people who use chainsaws and who use tractors and who use lawn mowers and, and all of these things that are polluting the environment. And how in the world can you consider yourself a real homesteader if you do those kinds of things and you don't care about climate change and the effect that these things are having on the planet? Uh, folks, whether or not you care about climate change or you're, you're a skeptic or, or whatever, the point is that you can be a homesteader, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, and use a chainsaw, use a tiller, use a tractor. You have a different perspective on homesteading, and that's okay. In my opinion, there is no right way to homestead. There's no right way to garden. There's no right way to raise chickens. There's no right way to raise pigs. There's do what works for you. And if you're having success doing it and you are pursuing self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability, you're a homesteader and keep on doing what you're doing. There is no right way to homestead. The next myth or misconception that I want to talk about is that in order to be a homesteader, you have to live in the country. Now, again, we talked about this back in our episode on what is homesteading. And I certainly don't believe that you have to live in the country in order to be a homesteader. But there are so many people who have that as the ideal romantic version of homesteading in their minds. And I understand why. Certainly, if you live in the country on one or two or five or ten acres of land, it's going to be much easier to raise and grow your own food than if you are dealing with a quarter acre or a small suburban backyard. You are going to have to be extremely creative in order to be able to raise and grow your food in an urban area. But it can be done and people are doing it. And so you don't need to think that if, in order for you to be a homesteader or in order for you to be a, to start your homestead journey, that you need to leave where you're at and go to the country. You can start your homestead journey right where you're at. You don't have to live in the country to do that. And right along with that, another myth or misconception that people have is that they have to wait to start their homestead journey. I see periodically on some of the homestead sites where people are saving up to buy a piece of property in the country. And that's great. That's awesome. But then they'll say, I can't wait to start homesteading. Folks, you don't need to wait to start homesteading. You can start homesteading where you're at right now. You know, do do something. You know, start reading books, start acquiring skills. And in fact, if you're on the homesteading sites, you're on the homesteading groups, you're on the homesteading forums, if you're watching YouTube videos, if you're listening to this podcast, guess what? You've started your homestead journey. Yes, you've started the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. You don't have to wait to start and every time I see that we're and I'm, I'm so excited I, I, I love to see people excited about moving to the country and buying a piece of property and, and getting chickens and pigs and all of that kind of stuff I love seeing people so consumed with that idea and excited about it but folks you don't have to wait you don't have to wait you can start right now another myth or misconception and this is where I'm going to start getting, I think, into a little bit of controversial stuff that people have with regards to homesteading is that it is a laid back, simple life. <sighs> Folks, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> I mean, it, it, what I mean by that is life is life no matter where you go. And yeah, maybe there are certain things that are simpler in the country. Like I said, it's going to be a lot easier for you to raise and grow your own food on a, a larger piece of property. But living in the country has just as many challenges and it has just as many pressures as living in the city. They're just different challenges and they're different pressures. You know, I know some people will say, well, in the city, it takes so long to get anywhere. 
you know, I want to go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and I've got to go, you know, it's a relatively short distance, but I have to, you know, I get stuck in traffic and it takes me a long time to get there. Well, you come to the country and yeah, maybe traffic isn't as bad, but now you've got to drive farther. So again, it's the same challenge. It's just a little different perspective on it. You know, I live a very, very busy life. I shared that with you in last week's episode, and I don't say that to brag. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is, I have a son who's 15 who's involved in a number of different things. And I love that he's involved in a number of different things. And I have the opportunity to be involved with him in a number of different things. But those add pressures to me and compete for my time uh, that I could otherwise put into the Homestead operations. And folks, I don't say that begrudgingly. I do not ever regret spending one moment with my son. I don't think I will ever look back and wish I had spent less time with him. But those pressures here in the country are the same as if you lived in the city. I have meetings sometimes every night of the week. And yes, that's what I have chosen to do. Okay, I have chosen to live my life that way. But the point is, is that in and of itself, homesteading is not intrinsically a simple laid back lifestyle. And in fact, I would argue that in many regards, it actually complicates and adds pressure to your life. Because when you stop and you think about it, what is more simple? going down to the grocery store and buying a can of beans, or tilling a garden, planting seed, weeding a garden, picking beans, ending beans, canning beans, so that you can eat that same amount of food. In my mind, it's a lot easier to go down to Hannaford, or to Kroger, or to Albertsons, or to the Piggly Wiggly, I don't know what grocery, I love that grocery store name, Piggly Wiggly. But anyhow, you, it's, it's a lot easier to go down to Aldi and buy a can of beans. It's, in my mind, it's a lot more simple to do that than it is to raise and grow it yourself. So this misconception, this idea, this romantic notion that people have that somehow life in the country is more simple and it's laid back, that's hogwash, or maybe I'm doing it all wrong. But, but folks, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people who are living this lifestyle in the country, and it's not laid back, and it's not easy, and it's not simple. You know, if you've got animals, that adds a whole level of complexity when you want to go away on vacation. If you have uh, animals... That means that sometimes in the middle of the night, when it's cold, you're outside checking on a sick or an injured animal. When it's not convenient, you're setting up uh, a pen for a pig that is going to Pharaoh because she was a little hussy and got in with a boar. That doesn't make my life more simple. It makes my life more complex. And folks, hear me out on this. I'm not saying that to complain. I love it. I don't want to lie and say I love every minute of it because sometimes it, it does suck. But it's all good. It's the life I've chosen. But don't think for a moment that in and of itself, homesteading is intrinsically a simple laid back lifestyle because it is not. Depending on the things that your kids are involved in and the, and the things that you're involved in, your life can be very, very complicated. And homesteading on top of that simply adds another level of complication. The final myth or misconception with regards to homesteading that I want to talk about is perhaps the most controversial one on this list. And that is the myth of the full-time homesteader. Now again, please hear me out on this, okay? Just hear me out on this. But I think some people have this very romantic, idealistic perspective of homesteading that is simply not connected to reality. And that is that I'm going to leave behind the rat race, going to move to the country, and I am going to live off the land. I'm going to be a full-time homesteader. 
The way I look at it is, unless you are independently wealthy, and not many of us are, or you're retired, maybe you're, you're you know, you have been a firefighter or a police officer, so you've kind of got an earlier retirement than some people who lit, work in the private sector might be able to do. Maybe you have retired early, um, and you have, but you have a retirement income stream. But unless you have one of those two things, in my opinion, it is not possible for you to be a full-time homesteader. Now, I'll say that with a few caveats. If you have one member of your household that goes off farm and works, then the other spouse may be able to homestead full time. But you are going to need a source of income because homesteading is not cheap. It takes real money. There's a real cost to raising real food. And so if you have this, this, I don't want to call it a fantasy, but maybe that's a little harsh. But if you have this view in your mind that you're going to go to the country and you're going to buy this property and you're going to live happily ever after living off the land, folks, that's probably not going to happen. You see, homesteading in and of itself does not raise revenue. Homesteading in and of itself does not create income. Homesteading in and of itself is very much focused on providing for your own needs from the standpoint of your food and your all of those kinds of things, right? Self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. The focus being on the word self. <laughs> now, that's not to say that there aren't things that you can do on your homestead in order to be able to create revenue and to provide yourself with an income stream. But now at that point, when you start doing those things, you're no longer homesteading full time. You are now an entrepreneur. You may have a business where you're selling soap or you're making knives like the hollers at the Holler Homestead. Uh, you may have a business like Jason Contreras and his wife over at Sow the Land where you are um, making wood things, things out of wood and selling them at a local market and making um, skincare products and selling them at a local market. But now you are, you know, you're making stuff and selling it. Now, some people look at people like Justin Rhodes and Rebecca or Aust um, Austin and his wife over at Homesteady, and uh, they look at them and they say, well, but there's examples of people that are full-time homesteaders. But they're not, folks. They're full-time content creators who happen to homestead. And they approach content creation as if it were a full-time job. Now you have people over uh, who are market gardeners. So like uh, the Fit Farmer and um, the folks, uh, Kevin and Sarah over at, um, what's their channel? Oh my goodness, I'm having a brain fart here. Living Traditions Homestead, there we go. Um, they're not full-time homesteaders. They're market gardeners that homestead. So folks, if your dream is to move to the country and become a full-time homesteader, I'm not trying to crush your dream. What I'm saying is that you have to somehow have some kind of way to generate income. Now, you may decide that you want to be a content creator, and great, but you've got to treat that like it's a full-time job. You may decide that you want to sell soap or make knives. That's great, but you're going to have to treat that like it's a full-time job. You're going to have to work at it. And there are times when just like working off farm, those things are going to get in your way. They're going to get in the way of your homesteading operation. You see, I think sometimes people see an off farm job as a barrier to being a successful homesteader. But the, the way that an off farm job can be a barrier to homesteading is the same thing, is the same way that an on-farm, an on-homestead job can be a barrier to your homesteading. So don't think for a moment that moving to the country <laughs> and uh, living on your homestead is going to take pressure off of you. And, and so now you can be this home, full-time homesteader and you have no cares. Because that's not real. That's not, that's not realistic. Somehow you've got to generate revenue. 
And so you may choose to be like I am. You may choose to work a full-time off-farm job. And that's okay. That's really the point of this. I, I may do, in fact, I think next week's episode is going to be focused on how to work a full-time job in Homestead and kind of focus on how do you balance all of those things? How do you juggle all of those balls? But folks, don't fool yourself for a moment. If you're going to move to, to the country and get a homestead, somehow you've got to generate revenue and income in order to be able to do the homesteading thing. And if you're an entrepreneur and, and, and that's your thing, then great, do it. But don't put yourself under pressure and think that that's what you have to do in order to be a successful homesteader. Because it's not. I'm not trying to crush your dreams. Folks, I'm just trying to give you a dose of reality. Now, um, I'll put a link to the video in the show notes. Uh, the SSL Family Dad put out a video a couple of uh, weeks ago with regards to how they fund their homestead. And it's a matter of they have multiple income streams, right? They're doing content creation through the YouTube channel. They're selling, I can't remember if it's goats or pigs, or they're selling some kind of livestock. They're doing a lot of things. And so if you are somebody who you can, you have the, the intestinal fortitude to be able to handle multiple smaller income streams that are variable, then that may be the way for you to go. But not everybody can do that. Some people want the security of a weekly paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can still do that and be a homesteader. Remember, there's no right way to homestead. All right, folks. That's this week's episode. Again, if, if you disagree with me, if you think I've missed it, I would love to hear from you. And you know what? If you think I'm spot on, I'd love to hear from you as well. I'm not saying any of this stuff to be controversial. Again, I'm not saying any of this to discourage anybody. Rather, I want to encourage as many people to be successful in the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the homestead journey podcast and if you haven't already i'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey until next time everybody keep up the good work